Okay. So we have 40 people waiting. I'm going to go ahead and let them in. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're going to start in a minute. In the meantime, feel free to drop on your name, affiliation, um, social media, and our discipline on the chat so we get a sense of who is in the room. We'll start in a minute. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Project Narrative and Budget Workshop organized by the Queen's Council on the Arts as part of the Professional Development Programming of QCA. We are so happy to have you uh, here in the room. Uh, my name is Daniel Valtuena, and I am the QCA Programs Assistant. And um, as I said, to get to know a little bit each other, like feel free to drop on your name, uh, our discipline, our art organization, um, also your neighborhood and your social media if you want on the chat so we get a sense of who is in the room. Um, I remind you that this event is being recorded and also um, a couple of technical uh, things. I encourage you to uh, ping the speaker mode going to the upper right corner so you know, see the people who is speaking at all times in case you want. And also um, stay muted uh, during the event since we are such a, a small group, uh, such a big group, sorry. And um, you know, we don't want to have some, back, uh, some background noise. Um, also, feel free to drop um, your questions on the chat throughout the event, and we will dedicate some time to questions during uh, a specific Q&A uh, moments uh, during the event. Um, and without further introduction, I am happy to introduce uh, Kelly Olson, QCA Program Manager, who is going to be hosting the event uh, tonight. Kelly? Hi, everyone. Good evening. So excited to have so many creatives in the room. I'm always uh, humbled when so many people decide to spend their Tuesday evening with us, as it were. Um, so I want to start off by just saying a couple words about the spirit of the evening, kind of the, the purpose and rationale behind why we wanted to put together this session. Um, and it's really about uh, providing access in terms of democratizing what kind of information is shared with artists and creatives. I think that so often the expectation for artists or creatives is to put together a grant application or apply for an art opportunity without a lot of good information or context as to what happens behind the scenes of that grant panel. What kind of conversations are had among cultural gatekeepers? How can you present your work in the best light? Um, and what is kind of the context um, for that evaluation process and discussion? And so the spirit of tonight is to really unveil the curtain as it were, and if nothing else, introduce you to some rock star, real cultural gatekeepers that have served as panelists at Queens Council on the Arts. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, throughout the session, we will, um, there'll be moments where you can contribute your ideas to the chat as well as ask questions. Um, but we'll ask that 
you sort of try to confine your questions to those particular moments, just so we have a, a better, uh, we're better able to make sure we address them. So I wanna go ahead and before we really dive in, uh, give you sort of just like a brief overview of Queens Council in the Arts and what we do in case you are not already familiar. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes. Great, so we are all going to pretend that we are together in Long Island City and QCA's new forthcoming space. Um, and in essence, Queens Council of the Arts is the Borough Arts Council of Queens that serves the entirety of the borough um, artists and arts organizations through um, programming that essentially falls into four discrete categories. In just a second, I'm gonna minimize this. Programming that falls into uh, four discrete categories from education, grants and residencies to organizations and individuals, professional development for creatives and our own commissioning program. So just to go through these briefly, our high school to art school is our free visual arts portfolio development program for teens. Um, the goal of which is to get teens into the art school of their dreams, ideally with a scholarship. So we provide art skills training and the college application assistance necessary to do that. And we've had great success getting students into every school across the country from Cooper to RISD to CalArts. We have three annual sessions a year and are about to open applications for our spring session, which is the introduction to portfolio development. So if you know any juniors or sophomores in the greater New York City area that want to go to art school or pursue an art career, please send them our way. I want to highlight our grants and residencies program. These are our two core permanent programs by that category. Our Sue Casa is an artist in residence program that places artists in senior centers across Queens in an effort to improve the quality of life of our older citizens. Um, the 2020 applications will be announced soon in the new year. Our Queen's Art Fund is especially relevant for this conversation in that it is our flagship grant program that is accepting applications now. As an organization or an individual artist, you can apply for this fund. Um, organizations can receive up to 5K, individuals up to 3K. Later, we're especially going to focus on the new work grant um, so you can keep that in mind. Um, and this is, as I mentioned, especially relevant because the application is due January 24th. So anyone in the room that's planning to apply to Queen's Arts Fund, this is uh, for you. And we will sort of dive into some example applications. Queen's Council of the Arts Artist Commissioning Program is unique to us and aims to democratize the commissioning process by enabling local community members affiliated with Queens or art commissioners, as we call them, to fill gaps in American culture by awarding commissions um, to artists who create projects that resonate with Queens neighborhoods and communities. We're currently in the process of revamping this program for a relaunch in spring of next year. So keep an eye out for that. Speaking of things to keep an eye out for, we have these three upcoming professional development events. We're gonna do another iteration of this event on January 13th, a sort of art, presenting art in the time of COVID on January 19th that highlights how to present work online and how to contingency plan during this ever evolving arts ecosystem that we currently find ourselves in. Um, and finally, an Ask a Gatekeeper series um, that will enable you all to have some one-on-one -on -one time with some of our panelists to go over your application specifically. And um, for you all, um, given you uh, made the time to invest in your creative practice by attending this workshop, you will receive first dibs. Um, so you'll have um, the first kind of VIP opportunity, if you will, to register for those slots. So we'll be sending out that announcement shortly. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I want to turn to you kind of the agenda for tonight. Um, so these uh, three um, programs, these core programs I mentioned, are really going to be kind of the focus of our conversation um, 
And luckily, our three guest speakers all have experience collectively with all three of these programs. So the Queen's Art Fund, Sukasa, and our artist commissioning program. And we selected these three rock star arts leaders because they have this deep knowledge of our own programs and are also just community leaders in Queens in their own right that are actively working in the field as well as potentially interested in collaborating with artists through the other types of work that they do outside of QCA. Um, so ladies, I wanna ask you to introduce yourself now, starting with Margaret. Hello everyone. I'm so glad to be here and to participate in this because I so very well understand what it means to write a proposal and, and not be quite sure whether or not you're hitting the mark. Um, I am still working at CUNY. I teach at York College and I am the director of the Fine Arts Gallery at York College. And um, I put in a plug for those of you who might be looking for exhibition environments. We have a, a really beautiful state-of-the-art gallery at York and we're always looking for proposals for shows to exhibit there. Um, I had a Sukasa. I had uh, an art site. I was on the panel for the commissioning program. I've been on the panel for Sukasa. Uh, and I have been on arts panels in different areas of the city as well with the MTA, with the DOT, that kind of thing. Once you're in there, they find you. <laughs> if you can show that you understand how to be uh, compassionate and, and impartial in many ways. So I'm, I'm happy to share with you what it's like to be on actually both ends of the spectrum. Thank you for being here. Perfect, thanks so much, Margaret. Hey, Jen. Hi everyone, it's so good to meet you. My name is Sajin um, and uh, I was, I had the opportunity to participate um, as a panelist um, a few times for not only the Queen's Art Fund, but also for the Artist Commissioning Program um, just this past year. Um, and for that program, we uh, focused on the Fleshy neighborhood, which was so much fun. Um, and I also applied once as an art port um, resident for the art port residency a few years back. So I do also have a good um, experience being on both sides of the of the um, application. So I'm really glad that we're having this program. And you know, clearly, not only does um, QCA want you to succeed, but we also are rooting for you um, and for your success. Um, other things, I'm at the Noguchi Museum um, as the education coordinator where I teach multiple uh, programs um, and I'm just really interested in, in community-based um, social justice actions and organizations. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sejan. Last but not least, Bronca. Evening, everybody. Um, I'm glad to see so many faces joining tonight. Um, uh, my name is Branka Duknik, and I was the um, ACP commissioner uh, for the year 2019-2020, um, together with Sejin, um, and um, I was also on, on different levels and different um, uh, spectrums of uh, behind the scenes, and as well as an applicant. Um, uh, I represent the Queen's Historical Society. I've been working for five years there as the executive director. And um, this is a place that, uh, even though it's a historical um, organization, it deals with uh, basically documenting history from pre-colonial times all the way to the current socioeconomic changes in the borough of Queens. Mm -hmm. So what better way to contribute um, uh, than as a panelist, but again, also as a, and as administrator and um, a fellow collaborator with other artists um, it was important to me to see both ends of the application process, and hopefully I can shed some light uh, on that for, for you all tonight. Excellent. Thank you, Branka. So I'm going to stop my share and uh, launch into the panel discussion portion of the evening. Um, if you all joined us in the last few minutes, just a friendly reminder that um, it's helpful to hit the pen speaker view on the top right so your computer will automatically pull up who's speaking um, in this uh, larger Zoom space. 
Um, okay, so I wanted to take maybe the next 20 minutes or so to chat with the three of you as to what goes on behind the scenes of a panel and kind of what works and what doesn't work. Um, so I feel like, you know, all of you are artists and creatives and nonprofit leaders in your own right. And I feel like when we are in those roles, submitting grant applications, often we do so into the ether without a lot of good information on what happens on the receiving end. Sometimes we never hear back, nonetheless get feedback. Um, and all of you have served on QCA panels and more before. Can you walk us through the QCA panel process from the panelist's perspective? How do you go about reviewing and evaluating the applications? And Sejan, I thought we could start with you. If you could walk us through what the Queen's Art Fund application looks like from the panelist side. What happens after an artist organization submits their application from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so from our perspective, we usually have a number of applications gathered into um, Oh, what's that? I think it's submissions. It's the, the website that you use for submissions. Um, but we have it organized so that we're able to look at each application individually. Um, and also um, so that we're able to um, make notes on each application digitally. So everything, um, and of course we're, we're asked by uh, QCA to review all the applications and make notes on each application um, as well as like have this um, rating system. So rate each application before we meet as a panel. Um, and um, based on the rating system, uh, QCA has this great way to um, kind of rank all of the different applications. Um, and then that's where, yes, submittable, thank you, Kelly. And then that's where the discussions really start um, is when we start to talk about the application based on the initial rankings and then of course review the applications one by one. Got it, okay. So in essence, you are, to summarize, you're reviewing them independently first as the first round and then come together as a group to make the final um, funding decisions through a conversation and review. Um, thank you, Sejan. So, Branka and Margaret, um, you both served um, on Sukasa as well as ACP Branka. Um, how was that process similar or different to what Sejan just outlined? What I did find in, in my experience is that there were very often disparate um, rankings so that in the room, uh, at the table, we needed to support our um, judgment of the level that a particular application would fall into. And so those who perhaps uh, left the application lower, or those who are higher, we would have to come to some kind of consensus as to where that application would fall. So the, the conversation is it, always very, very collegial and, and it's an opportunity to pull out aspects of an application that we might have read differently from someone else. Mm -hmm. So the process really doesn't just stop with what shows up in the, in the digital ranking and submittable, that we actually do spend hours on end with lunch together, <laughs> coming, coming, boiling things down to a, a, a small pool of finalists uh, that we would then work with to choose the ones that we had enough funds to fund. But very often there are applications that end up not being funded that if we had more money, they might've been funded for sure. Absolutely. Franca, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. And I was just sort of taking mental notes of what else uh, we're doing. And this is something that um, QCA has been mentioning many, many times, which is making the process so egalitarian, so democratic, you know, and being someone, um, you know, behind the scenes, seeing how we vote and how even 
if there are a few votes against a specific, not against, but you know, favoring a certain artist um, in the minority, we try to sort of through discussion realize that the vote should be unanimous towards a group of artists. And it's very fair, um, not only democratic in the sense that if in my case, I knew a few artists or I've collaborated with a few artists on an application for our museum, um, I would just, you know, excuse myself um, and, you know, go into another room. And not to mention before COVID, if we can even remember those times, um, we would have these meetings at really great cultural sites, museums, uh, cultural institutions. So that's also a great opportunity for the local uh, organization to um, sort of get highlighted and at the same time for the ACP commissioners to, um, you know, visit those sites for some of them that, you know, they weren't familiar with. Nice, thank you. Yeah, there's two pieces that I kind of want to highlight um, from what you all just said. One is there's this prevalent myth out there that QCA or like our staff are the ones making the funding decisions. And I, I understand that perspective because it's intuitive, right? You assume, oh, an arts organization is giving a grant and that arts organization makes the decision. And in many cases, um, that is how it works. Um, but in our case, it's not the staff that has any say. It's um, really the role of real community members and, um, cultural workers in the borough. And I bring that up to say that I think another myth that also is sometimes true um, is that you submit something and nobody reads it, no one deliberates over it. The conversations that Branka and Margaret you just described aren't necessarily happening, but here they truly do. I mean, you all spend hours reviewing on your own six hours reviewing in person. We feed you, thank God, but it's a long day. Um, what would you say to, do you think there's a value in applying purely because real people in the arts in the borough are going to be reading your application? Are you asking whether that's a, pl a plus or a minus? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think it it's definitely a plus. Then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely a plus because they're a, QCA is queen centric. I mean, there there's something to be said about a smaller pool, which is what it is, because you have to be a queens based artist in order to apply. Whereas uh, many of the uh, applications that are out there for fellowships and funding and grants, etc., are national or some international. And so the pool is so huge that, you know, you hit submit and then you, you know, pretty much going about your business and don't even expect to hear from them again. <laughs> and when you do, it's like, you know, Eureka, but at least with QCA, you know that we are invested in, in, in getting this, the um, artists of our borough out there and working and supported. So it's, it's worth it to do it, yes. And it's worth it to put a lot of time and effort into it as well. Thank you, Margaret. So speaking of um, panelists advocating for applications, what in the three of you's mind makes an application really compelling, really stand out? What are some of the things when you're in the panel room that make you really want to advocate for a project to receive funding? I can sort of uh, chip in, I think, on this in a, in a non-artist background. Um, I think it's important to be very clear, to give a very precise context uh, about your narrative, about the backgrounds. And I keep getting um, the same example, but it's treat us as uh, absolutely, people who are oblivious, I use the word Martians, but, you know, really treat us like someone who has never heard of a specific cultural history or background on a, on a given um, community. So uh, let's just say, again, Queens being so amazing, the largest borough uh, with, uh, we're talking about, I know everybody reads the same thing, 150 something languages spoken. Um, we might recognize it, but 
be mindful of the fact that we have no clue of your background. So, um, and also if you're giving and talking about multiple cultural histories or, or any stories, be oh, mindful yeah. That, yeah, be mindful that there's a thread, a thread that connects them all. Because some of the applications had an issue with uh, just depicting several stories and us not being able to um, understand why you're particularly, is this a geographical connection? Is it a, an ethnic connection or anything like that? So I feel like that's the most important, important thing. Thank you, Branka. Yeah, I remember in the artist commissioning program panel that coming up that there were some projects that had a really specific cultural heritage or lineage and, and you saying, oh, it'd be helpful if I had more information because I, I wouldn't know otherwise. Say, Jen, you're nodding. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, um, just adding to what Branka was saying about us being, really, we are totally clueless. Like just, um, I think as long as the application can include as much information as possible so that we as the panelists can really um, imagine your whole project in your head. Um, I feel like the more concrete details um, and the better idea of a project, something that's fully baked instead of half baked that you give, the more that you're able to convince the panelists that this, your project should be funded. So things like um, definitely, you know, details about, about your overarching project, but um, also things like compelling work samples that even adds to how we might imagine um, your project. So all of those things matter. And um, yeah, just definitely having everything in, in there so that we can really see it happening. Yeah, that's a, a great synopsis. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later when we dive into project narrative examples. But one of the things that we sort of discussed as general advice for everyone is when you write your project narrative, the, the panelists should leave having a really concrete sense of what you're going to do, what does your work look like, sound like, feel like, like help create, paint a picture. I'd like to add that you want to avoid unnecessary information. I, we have a lot of reading to do. If it, if, it isn't, if it isn't something that pertains to what it is that you're trying to ask us to fund, don't put it in there. And to make sure that your images are good quality images and that they have a point that goes along with your project narrative that we understand why we're looking at the images. Um, and that you um, speak about how the work will offer your audiences something to take away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you're doing is enriching for your own studio practice, of course, but we want to know in bringing it out in the open, what, it, what do your audiences have to take away from your work? Totally. And that's especially relevant for the Queen's Art Fund because part of the mission is to not only benefit the individual artists organizations, but the community at large. Um, Margaret, I want to follow up on what you said about we have so much reading to you. Can you help many an artist in the room who's never been on a panel understand how much reading do you have to do? What is it? How, what's the sheer amount of like the quantity of information that you're going through? Well, for the first artist commissioning pro project, we, we had 60 applications to read, all, all of them. It's not like we divvy them up and some people read some people. And we read all of them. Everybody on the panel reads all of them. And there is a limit to how many words you can have in your, in your project um, narrative. But uh, more often than not, the artists use the right down to the limit. So if it's a thousand words, there's a thousand words there. You know, whether they needed all thousand of them or not, they're there, you know, that kind of thing. So for me, it's like, if you're gonna use all a thousand words, they have to be necessary. You know, they have to have really filled me up with an understanding of what it is that you're, you're planning to do and how it is that you are the one that should do it. I mean, that is, that is very important to your narrative that you have in there this sense of, I'm the artist that should complete this project and why. Um, but yeah, 
a lot of reading. And so you got to pace yourself. I don't usually sit for more than an hour with a group of applications and go away and come back again so that they don't, they don't start to run into each other. Totally. And that's sort of the, a move of a seasoned panelist. But I think it's, I, I think it's as an artist worth sort of assuming that the person that is not assuming, but right in a way to where even if someone is bleary eyed, has read 10, 15, 20 applications in a row, just worked all day at their nonprofit day job or is doing this at night out of the love of the arts, um, they can read your application and still get a sense of what you want to do and why it's important. Okay, so last question for the three of you. Can you talk about what not to do? When you sat on a QCA panel, what are some of, what were some of the mistakes or pitfalls that kept coming up that you would advise artists or small organization leaders to um, try to avoid? Well, for me, I understand that we are prompting people to, uh, to propose new work. But if, if an application is so far out of an artist's wheelhouse and they don't offer enough information to uh, explain how it's going to fit into what they already know how to do, then you question whether or not it's possible. So, you know, if, if you're going to do new work that's way out of your wheelhouse, I hope you understand what I mean by that, you know, then, then you really have to make, make a point of how it is that you can reach that new goal, that new space, doing something really different. Uh, stay away from things that are too complicated for the time that you have to do it in. We do have a timeline when we expect you to see this happen and the funding that's available to you to get it done. So your budget should be in alignment with what it is that you're saying you want to do um, so that it, it all makes sense. You have to have these things in alignment. Excellent, thank you. Bronca, say Jen, uh, common mistakes to avoid? I would say like be very factual, make sure that if you are covering, you know, as a, as a background in sort of uh, culture and history, you know, be, be mindful of your um, summaries if you're dealing with a specific um, aspect of, let's say, um, art inspired by um, Queen's history or contemporary past. Just be very mindful of that. And uh, I should say we would really welcome to have any audio or visual, depending on you know what art facet you're in, um, examples. But do not overload us with that, please. So select as Margaret said, um, just a few that are kind of related to your application. If I could just chime in on that note, um, for artists that are submitting video works, um, you can, in the QAF application, submit 30 minutes and just tell us which three minutes you want us to look at. But if you don't do that, we're not gonna have time to watch 30 minutes and just take the opportunity to tell us what it is you in particular want us to see. Proof, proofread. I forgot to say that. Proofread, proofread, proofread. Absolutely. Um, definitely, I think it's the whole communication thing where we want your application to be as clear to us as possible. So definitely proofreading. Um, and um, like I think both Margaret and Bronco were saying, making sure that your timeline and your budgets are realistic. Um, just having those in mind. Yeah, asking people, asking your friends, asking your colleagues, work colleagues even to read so over. Right. Okay. Now, do you want one of these drinks? Thanks, Sejan. Uh, yes, proofreading is a common error, as is um, some budgets that don't add up, and we're going to talk about that um, in a couple of minutes when we segue into sample applications. But before we do, do so, I want to open it up to um, any questions that were about for the panelists or for me about what we just covered. I think we have time for maybe two questions. Um, so feel free to take a moment to add them to the chat and um, I'll turn it over to Daniel who's gonna pick out a couple questions from the chat for us to answer. Yes, thank you, Kelly. 
Um, so Kelly BC is asking that um, um, she is a photographer but wants to uh, add a couple of video supplements to photos a few minutes at a time and would that be acceptable? Um, and um, that's her question in terms of her application and if that will be acceptable. Couple minutes of video supplements to photos, a few minutes of time, would that be acceptable? Um, it's really, I think just need to follow um, the instructions on the application. So if, if you're asking about Queen's Art Fund specifically, we actually have our Queen's Art Fund manager present, um, Jenna London. If Jenna, you wanna weigh in as to this QAF work sample application. Sure, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jenna. Um, yes, you are. There is a, um, space to add additional materials. Um, so for the Queen's Arts Fund application, you would be able to um, upload videos as well. Um, but I would defer to the panelists if you think that would be recommended um, to a photographer or um, depending on how long those work samples and the videos uploaded would be. Your image samples just need to be illustrative of what it is you're trying to get us to understand about your practice. So if it makes sense that you have a still that then moves or because it's a part of what you're trying to tell us you want to do, then sure, it makes sense. Um, you, don't, you don't want your visual material to just show your, your work, your practice. It should be specific to what you're asking us to fund. Yeah, makes sense. Everything should be tied to the what and the why of your application and you're being deliberate about everything you submit, including the work samples. Um, so I'm gonna answer one more question um, that's about sharing scores and potentially asking us if we're able to um, share the individual scores of applications. Um, the answer is, is sort of yes and no. Um, no, we're not able to share individual scores of real applications because um, we don't want to reach the confidentiality of individual artists. But what we're actually going to do now is um, take a look at a fictionalized version of that. And so actually, this is a nice segue. I'm going to uh, share with you all um, a sort of low, um, a made up low low scoring application on the cusp application that received a score about in the middle and then a real live funded application that scored very highly so you can sort of conceptually um, imagine that we are sharing scores with you even without the individual numbers okay um so i'm gonna go ahead and segue into the example applications component of the evening Great, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, so for those of you who uh, did your homework or came super prepared, this is the workshop um, worksheet that I circulated in advance, but if you didn't have time to look at it, no worries at all. Um, in essence, we are going to um, take the next 30 minutes or so to go over example applications, which we're cheekily calling the good, bad, and the funded. So we're gonna walk through three mock proposals. One, a not so effective one. Two, a on the cusp one. So this would be like a mid scoring application, Renee. Um, both of these are fictional, but based on hundreds of real applications that Queens Council and the Arts staff look through. Um, so they're meant to kind of be avatars of ineffective and on the cusp new work grants to the Queen's Art Fund, so individual artist grants. And then finally, a real funded recipient of the Artist Commissioning Program Award. Um, we're gonna focus on the project narrative piece as well as the budget. Um, so moving right along, um, we'll take a look at the ineffective proposal first. And um, this worksheet is meant for you to take home and mull over a little bit later. We're not gonna read it verbatim because that would not be too much fun, um, but we'll go over the, the key points and uh, sort of pretend like we're at a panel and hear from the panelists themselves as to their thoughts. So first up, 
Um, this is an example of a not so great proposal. Um, the first thing that you should do when you're applying for a grant is to figure out what you're applying for. What is the scope? What is the funding priority? So in this case, we're gonna take a look at the Queen's Arts Fund. This is a new work grant. Um, so in essence, to summarize this, this is a project grant for individual artists for new work. Must be Queen's based artists. So that's just the general eligibility. We're gonna take a look at the project narrative. So that's just like the, a component of the grant application, but the component that um, my colleagues and I, Jenna and I deemed, um, and QCA staff deemed most important among the QAF application. Um, so here it is. Um, Margaret, can I ask you to read the highlighted sure. project? Sure. Um, I plan a staged reading of my play in Queens theaters, which I've been writing and researching for the four years. The project bring to life 10 plus characters, all based on real people, mostly from Queens. The show utilizes puppets and actors to portray the storyline. The full production will involve the construction of a portable puppet theater. The stage reading is a step towards a full production. I am hoping that by having the reading in a good venue to get more people in Queens interested and thus help me work towards this goal. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was a, this is a fictionalized application of a low scoring QAF new work grant, just to reiterate. Okay, so Margaret, help me unpack what's not working here. Do you have a, after reading this, do you have a clear sense of what the new work will be? No, um, I do have a sense of how it, the structure of it. It's, it's very confusing because the stage reading, as far as I know, does not include props at all and, and uh, building. And so we move from what is a stage reading, it opens as a stage reading, to a project that requires uh, building. Uh, a, a puppet theater. Uh, so that's kind of confusing. The, the biggest problem is that we don't know what the story is about. There's a storyline mentioned, but we, there is no sense of, of what, what, is, what is the story about. And it's not new. Uh, we have an, an artist who's been working on this project for years. That's not to say that you can't propose a project that you have been thinking about and researching over time, but you need to bring it back together. You need to say, okay, it's new because I've never let it out of my head or out of my journal or you know, wherever it has been living as it has been growing, but it doesn't read as a new project, as something that is new for this Queen's application the way this narrative comes across. Um, perhaps adding the puppet show was new. So you need to say that and, what, and to make clear about what the story is about. And proofread, I mean, this is, this is not a proofread uh, application. There are too many grammatical errors in there and that is jarring. Uh, so, and, and it, it isn't, just about because I work with students that English is not their first language. So it's not only about, it's about taking the determination and the diligence to take the time to proofread carefully so that you're actually getting across what it is that you're trying to say, what you are asking us to support and to fund. So that, that was really uh, a big part of this one for me. And also, um, don't say you're hoping to do something. Say you're planning to do it. That's, you're planning to do it, that's a goal. And a, you give a sense that even if you don't get the funding from this application, you're gonna do it anyway. So, you know, it should be a plan and not a hope. Hope is too soft. Harden that up. Totally. You just gave a really nice synopsis of a lot of uh, things that come up around low scoring applications that 
we don't know what the work is going to look like. Um, that the scope isn't like a lack of clarity. The scope isn't clear and it's not clear if it's new work, which is what the Queen's Art Fund expressly funds. Um, so Jen, Bronca, do you have anything, uh, do you have anything to add? Well, mostly just, you know, the, um, the phrases and the buzzwords that are used but not elaborated on, for example, what are real people as opposed to unreal, you know, like who, what makes us real? Are they, is that, that their socioeconomic status? Is it their background? Uh, again, cultural background. Um, that's something that, and, you know, we haven't really heard of the storyline. Um, I know this is just a synopsis, but it, you, it should capture the storyline in at least one sentence. So that's, that's the truly most important thing, something that catches our eye in this day and age where everybody's a little ADD. I'm kidding, I'm, but it's, 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 a, it's a situation which all of us are faced with. You have to read something quickly. And if you do, and again, after reviewing 40 plus applications, if this doesn't uh, give a clear image of what you're planning to do, then sorry, yeah, we'll have to pass on it. Absolutely. I forgot to mention that there's no sense of who the audience is. And that's also very important. We mentioned that earlier as well. Who's the ideal audience? Is this a show for children? Is it a show for adults? Is it a show for you know families? Um, who's your audience? And don't be afraid to suggest an ideal venue in Queens. You don't have to have, you know, already the 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 uh, the, the place nailed down. But there might be some place that you say, you know, I would love to be able to do this on the JPAC stage, you know, that kind of thing to, to actually say you can see this happening in a venue that you know of in Queens. Yeah, so in the Queens Art Fund application, there's this project narrative piece and then there is a separate place, just to clarify to everyone, there is a separate place where you can expand upon your intended audience. but our Queen's Art Fund manager, Jenna, likes to talk about the project narrative is almost like an executive summary. So even if you're not gonna go on and on about the audience, to Margaret's point, all the key pieces should, should be here. And then you have the opportunity to expand upon them in uh, separate sections. Um, so I don't wanna spend too, too much time on the um, low scoring application. So say, Jen, um, why don't you help us just wrap up with this one? Um, I'd love to hear, if you were in a room advising this artist, this applicant, what suggestions might you have for them to improve this narrative? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely uh, flesh it, flesh the idea out more, specify who the characters, what the who, what, when, where, why, right? Including those details so that exactly what story is told, um, specify if this is new work, um, where and when the timeline, how, when this is going to happen, um, and definitely just all the details to make us, uh, to make us better able to imagine it. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just for everyone's reference, we put together some trends among ineffective project narratives. I'm not going to read them. We've all sort of, everyone has touched upon them, but just a quick synopsis for reference. Okay. Moving right along to an on the cusp application. Um, before I dive into this, um, I kind of want to explain to people why on the cusp Queen's Art Fund applications are so um, consequential. And that is because the way the Queen's Art Fund is scored, essentially the panel collectively decides on um, a cutoff point and everything above that number is funded and everything below is not. So at least in my experience sitting in on panels, there's a lot of attention given to these on the cusp because that's the difference between money or not. Um, so that's my, my intro. And then I'll say if the sort of 1.0 applying to grants is just figuring out what the thing is, what the eligibility criteria are, the second are really these um, really paying attention to the evaluation criteria. So these are the Queen's Art Fund evaluation criteria. Um, I'm not going to read them, but I just wanted to hit the point that, you know, when the Broncos and Sejans and Margarets of the world are reading your application, they have these four things 
literally that they're scoring and weighing your application against. And so, you know, my advice is to really take these seriously and um, sort of weigh and evaluate and consider your application against these criteria um, through Queen's Art Fund or any other grant you're applying for. Like if they tell you what you're, they're looking for, I would damn sure, you know, pay attention to that. Okay, so here's a fictionalized on the cusp new work UAF grant application. So Jen, you do the honors of reading the project narrative? Sure, of course. Uh, the project will consist of 10 photographic assemblage pieces for exhibition. Each image will focus on one ethical or moral issue using models to represent humans' interactions with the world through an artistic lens. I will start photographing uh, Queen subjects for this project by winter 2021. Around this time, I will also begin connecting with people around different Queens neighborhoods to build community interest. These conversations will strengthen the neighborhood support as well as inform their artistic imagery. Around June, I will start assembling and collaging the photographed images in earnest. From about June to September, I will be working on the layout and potentially gathering more photography. By late September, I will have the final prints made. In October, the photographs will be completed and ready to show at the Plaxall Gallery in Lyon City for a three-week exhibition. Thank you so much. Okay, so question for any three of you, all three of you. After reading this, do you have a clear sense of what this new work will be? No. Not really, no. <laughs> I mean, a general story, of course, but um, you know, nothing into what kind of moral and ethical issues are we talking about? Again, goes back to the thread. What are you connecting multiple moral issues? Are they contemporary? Or I mean, obviously they are, but you know, um, is it something connected to some sort of a background uh, uh, structure? You know, that's, and of course we're seeing the timeline essentially of the project, but we're not seeing the in-depth, uh, um, you know, explanation of, of the actual proposal. Yeah, that's a great point that we really wanted to highlight to you all because here you have limited real estate. Here's, you know, this three paragraphs describing your new work and two thirds of it, over two thirds of it is just dedicated to logistics, it's timeline. And this is a common mistake that we see a lot. We also can't judge whether or not uh, people in different Queens neighborhoods would support this project because we don't know what it's grounded in. Like what are the ethical and moral issues at hand? And are they something that we can, as people who live in Queens ourselves, you know, can imagine that you, know, you could go to a, a neighborhood community center and, and get buy-in to help you with your project? Totally, I think that's a really good example of how and why really diving into the meat of what your art project is is relevant, not just because this is an arts grant and we want to know, but it helps answer questions beyond like who would be interested in this. And um, I think that, I think that as artists, sometimes we take, we take the, the sort of nuts and bolts of what you do and why almost for granted and neglect to put it in writing in some cases. Say, Jen, do you have anything to add? Um, I guess specifically, actually, I, I want to rephrase that to say, if you are advising this applicant and telling them, okay, it'd be helpful to expand upon X, what would that be? Yeah, um, I think definitely, again, um, reining in that, like, defining what exactly you're focusing on as, as your goal. Like, and also I think um, just going back to what Margaret was saying about, um, you know, your attention behind actually proposing this plan. Are you like, you're not, you know, you shouldn't be proposing this plan for the sole purpose of, um, you know, Queens Art Fund, but as an, art, as an artist, you're already going to pursue this. So things would help, for example, um, you know, have you already touched base with these neighborhoods that you want to focus on? You know, have you already touched base with organizations in those specific neighborhoods? Or are you already thinking about these different um, specific moral and ethical issues? Um, and also another point 
the reason why it's important to specify like what ethical or moral issue lens you're working with is because um, I think in the Queen's Art Fund's evaluation criteria, um, you know, one of the criteria is to demonstrate community benefit. If you're thinking about the community, if you're, if you're also thinking about um, an ethical or moral issue, um, then are you thinking about those moral issues in an inclusive way that benefits the community? So these are the reasons why we need all these details. And I, I urge everyone to not fear actually using your own community. Mm -hmm. You know, to begin in a place where you are comfortable and you can actually say, this will work or this won't work because this is my home. This is where I live. These are the people I know. And then you can say, okay, I want to, I want to branch out beyond that. But having that kind of stability in place is actually very, very effective. And uh, another thing that I'm saying around this is that the visual part of this project isn't really connecting for me to the conversations that are supposed to take place. Like I can't see these assemblage constructions with photographs connecting to the conversations that will build them. Because mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be, it's the engagement with people that are that's helping this artist build those compositions. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's not just about being sure that panelists can picture what you're describing, but how what you're describing feeds into the mission and the goal and the concept of your proposal. Okay, um, I want to touch a little bit on the budget for this particular um, example. And um, I'm gonna ask, turn it back to say Jen, because you have served as a QAF panelist three times, is that right? So you've seen a lot of budgets. Um, how common is it for the numbers to just not add up? Yeah, more common than than I hoped, than I would hope, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I feel like as QAF panelists, people just sort of breathe a sigh of relief when everything lines up because often it doesn't. And so I just wanna give like a quick overview of what it should look like. Um, so this is a sample budget that is based off of the fictionalized, it goes with the project narrative we just read. Um, not going to read it aloud, you guys can look at it on your own, but just wanted to hit a few key points. Um, one, this sounds silly, but put the amount in the amount column, put the itemized explanation in the itemized explanation column, because if you put words where numbers are supposed to go, then the numbers like don't add up because it we automate the formula. Um, so just put everything where it needs to go. That'll help make sure everything adds up. Um, but in essence, what you can expect for the Queen's Art Fund application in particular, um, and generally grants at large, um, you're gonna have a project expenses table. So this is all money out, um, things that you uh, will spend for artistic personnel, equipment, supplies, et cetera, any money out affiliated with the project. Um, your total expenses, um, might be more than what you're you're requiring, what you're uh, asking for. So this is a three thousand dollar grant, but the total project is in this case four thousand one hundred. So you can think about this as um, the the total amount of money you would need to do this project. And then you're going to have an income table that is all the money um, hopefully coming in. I want to stress that you are not including the Queen's Art Fund grant here. So if you're applying for $3,000, that doesn't go in the income. Okay, so the only thing that will go in the income is other projected um, or confirmed expenses, like if you hope to sell some artwork, or you're pitching in your own money, or you got another grant, and you can just describe what that is here, and you add it up. And then the main point I want to hit home is this final third table where all those pieces come together. So from the expenses table, um, you'll migrate that number, income, migrate that number. And so um, your total grant request should be total expenses minus income equals request. I repeat, expenses minus income 
equals total grant request. So if you're applying for the new work grant, that should add up to $3,000, assuming you apply for the whole amount, which we recommend you do. Um, it's, it's a simple thing. Once you get it, it'll click and you'll never have to think about it again. Um, but you'd be surprised how many people kind of get confused by this. So you can refer to this as your template. Um, any, anything else, uh, panelists, to add in terms of what not to do um, with budget? Have you ever seen some numbers that seem a little wonky or not so well researched? The technical assistant personnel, $75? Seven. That's way too low. Help with installation? Way, way, way too low. Oh, this part? Yeah. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I mean, uh, unless it's your, your brother and you're feeding them that night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that's that's too low. And if you're looking at professional outside services, then frames and mats is not service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so categorization. Really yeah, Be, you know, stick to what it is that the expense type is. Yep. Sajan, Branka, any other thoughts on the budget? Yeah, and um, I'm pretty sure this is the case, and correct me if I'm wrong, but especially in terms of the income, they don't have to be like 100% guaranteed, right? So for example, if there is like a pending sale of an art, not pending, sorry, um, and uh, approximate like a, um, yeah, like a pending sale of an anticipated sale of an artwork, then that doesn't have to necessarily like pan out in order for um, the application's budget to be qualified. Yeah, exactly. In fact, we ask right here if the funding is committed or pending. And so in the case of a hopeful sale or monetary contribution, you can just simply write, oops, sorry, simply write pending in that right-hand column. And arts organizations and nonprofits do this all the time, you know, apply for grants, cross our fingers that more money is going to come in and then just put pending in the application. <laughs> so it's not just an individual artist thing. You're, you're in good company. Everyone kind of plays this game when it comes to grants. You can also use that area for pro bono work. So if your brother is indeed going to help with your installation, you can actually put those hours as pro bono. In other words, if you didn't have a brother who could help you with installation or a sister who could help you with installation, you'd have to pay for that. You see what I'm saying? So that can be considered income in kind, in kind. towards your project. Yes. All that an in kind contribution. And yeah. So, but it would, yeah, it would be in kind. So it would be in the income line. I actually had that happen um, where there was a pro bono pro bono work that I would have had to have paid for. Yeah, um, also adding to what Margo was saying, I think people, you know, it's really awesome when you realize the creativity you can use in order to list things for income, like um, pro bono work, as Margaret was saying, and also if um, like an organization offers to um, lend you their building space for free, that's also income. Other ways, um, I had this friend, a musician who, um, uh, organized like a donation event, um, donation event where um, she just like estimated how much she would earn from that one event. Um, so like there's so many different ways and I guess now because of COVID you can do this virtually, um, but there's a lot of different ways where you can um, know the different kinds of income. Yeah, great points. Um, I think that artists are often really good at sort of receiving deals or, you know, in-kind assistance um, and just and that's great, but just make sure to put it down so panelists aren't wondering, how did you get this for $75? Like if you don't explain, they might think that, um, you know, it sounds unrealistic or um, doesn't add up. Um, yes, so in-kind contributions are your friend. Um, let's move right along um, to a real funded application. Um, so this is a real project narrative um, that received a $10,000 commission through our artist commissioning program last year. Um, and I think will be a really helpful example, especially as we were talking about um, not being afraid to support your own community, whether that's geographically or psychographically, as they say. I think this application um, does a really great job of this. 
Um, I also want to mention uh, that this we were talking about, you know, the language barriers when it comes to grant applications. And I guess worth mentioning that this uh, artist, English is her second language, and she just worked on the application and really hit the points uh, home. So you don't have to um, necessarily be, you know, you don't have to be super, super comfortable writing in English to uh, be successful. So here we go. Oh, and I also just want to highlight, if you're not familiar with this artist commissioning program, just know that the funding priority is right here. Um, it's about telling an untold story of underrepresented protagonists. We ask that proposals highlight individual protagonists of so characters, heroines, heroes, etc. Um, that give underrepresented people a vision of themselves as leading characters. So uh, Branca served on not this particular panel, but as a artist commissioning program panelist and commissioner. Can I ask you to read this proposal? Um, and you can read just the, just the highlighted section for time. Sure, no problem. And a uh, shout out to the artist. Um, uh, I want to tell the stories of Latin female and LGBTQ characters who have an essential role in our society, but are currently underrepresented in the mainstream Latin music scene. The story of Abuela Consuelo, for instance, cooking every day for a family of 10 and passing on her cultural traditions through food. The story of Marta, who had to fight against cultural prejudice to be in a homosexual relationship. I want to tell my story, an immigrant, white Latina with an identity crisis fed by the fact that her skin tone and body features don't match the stereotypical image of Latina woman portrayed in mass culture. As a consequence of these characters underrepresentation and misrepresentation, children born from Latin immigrants growing up in US have a lack of role models who can echo their cultural traditions and at the same time inform them of new canons of constantly changing society. To give Latin youth role models to identify with and aspire to, I will write, re write, record, and premiere Canciones for a New World, a bilingual Spanish-English song cycle for children. I think you can skip the second part, Branca, uh, just okay. for the interest of time. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, just for reference, there's more info on this uh, proposal written by uh, the one and only Michelle Palmieri. Um, okay, so let's let's discuss. Uh, Pranga, what is working well on this proposal? What do you think this artist is doing effectively? Um, I think it's hitting all the marks that we talked about. It gives um, an underlying background of a specific uh, community, whether it is ethnic background or uh, gender and sexual orientation. Uh, so it really gives, and also, as we talked about the phrase, the untold story of a particular set of identities that need to be portrayed and also gives a specific focused audience that this is, this project is intended to, in this case, children, which is a very unique thing. Let's think about it, you know, just um, uh, looking at the audience members being uh, children of a certain age, and on top of that being bilingual brings it way more together to and at least in my opinion as a you know as a co-applicant together with artists on the perspective of my organization um i've had more success in grants being you know and showing some forms of um approachability by using bilingual means so i think this is a a star application yeah it's very specific it clearly answers the question of this is what i'm going to make and this is my target audience yeah um, it's also very personal. You, you, you get a sense that you know who this woman is. I mean, she reveals some very personal things about herself mm -hmm. and in a spoken word tone in her prose, which is very um, sort of engaging. You, you, wanna, you wanna see her do this. You wanna, you wanna see this happen uh, and you wanna get to know her better. Yeah, you become invested in this individual and her story. So Jen, anything to add on um, what's working well here? Absolutely, and um, this is really uh, getting to the um, the what ACP is asking it for is to um, fill in the void of um, underrepresented individuals, and you know this just connects so well. This um, project narrative connects so well because she's saying that there is a need for um, underrepresented uh, gender and sexuality. Um, 
minority, no, I'm sorry, uh, leadership um, roles. And she really wants to fill that void. And so, um, I mean, I just think it just connects so well. Yeah, she's very clear about this is the problem with our society and this is how my art is trying to address this dearth of narrative in American culture. Um, I also, I think I, what I appreciate about what you said too is that I think often with these grant proposals, it's not artists who aren't funded, it's not a reflection of them as humans or a reflection of their creative practice, but like so many other things, it's just about the fit and the projects that that stand out are the ones that really are a good fit for the particular opportunity in which they're applying. And that's the lesson that you can extrapolate, you know, not just if you're applying for ACP or Queens Art Fund, but I think, you know, any grant or art opportunity. Okay, so a couple more questions for you on this proposal. Um, do you, does this, once you read this, do you have a vision of what the project will be? and what it intends to accomplish. Um, I believe um, Michelle has also expressed in, I think at the lower section that she's, um, there were not enough representations of songs and melodies that children can, um, you know, the inclusive uh, uh, and updated and upgraded uh, songs that um, Latino, Latinx uh, children can enjoy. So I think this is a, a very strong component, I would say, that, that uh, brings about sort of the clarity of the whole uh, project in my perspective, you know, just bring something new to the table and something not only new to the table, but also new to the generations that will come. So there's a, a big value in, in you know, educating and re-educating youth in this way. Thank you. Um, any other final thoughts on this project? Um, any kind of lessons that you feel like um, can be extrapolated from this example for artists that are applying um, to QAF and beyond? I think this application actually did everything that we we wished the other two had done. I mean, it's all there. It's very concrete uh, intentions, audience, uh, methods, uh, reason, rationale behind those methods. It's, it's all there. Um, and also you get a, a real sense of what it is trying to, to uh, displace. Uh, the, the sort of negativity of some of the music that is out there and to replace it with something that is equally as enjoyable to engage in and very contemporary, but yet has a different message, a more positive message for these particular uh, young, young females, young LBGTQ um, listeners. So it's, it's very clear what uh, this artist wants to do and why um, not only that she believes it's important, but that we should join her in understanding its importance. She really does market this well with words. Uh, yes. and, and that's, that is not necessarily very easy to do. And I'm sure that she had this application read by many eyes before she submitted it. Yeah. I actually worked with Michelle to, uh, um, she went through several, several drafts. Um, so if anyone's wondering, like, oh, I, I can't just, you know, birth a perfect application from scratch. No one does. Like she went through several drafts. Um, well, that was really well said, Margaret. I think I want to uh, end that there. Um, thank you all for your really thoughtful sort of mock panel uh, discussions. Um, for the next 15 minutes, uh, we would love to just turn it over to questions. So um, participants, if um, there's something that, uh, if there's a specific question you have about your own application, uh, this is a moment that we can uh, help you brainstorm or problematize. It can be a question for myself, for Jenna, um, or for our three panelists. So. 
gonna open it up to the chat if you wanna drop in uh, questions and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so Daniel, I'll turn it over for you, our resident uh, chat monitor or, and question asker. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you also to our panelists for all your um, like illuminating thoughts or comments. I actually have been answering some of the questions on the chat and Jenna as well, um, but I do see an interest in knowing uh, what to do with applications that um, are planning to um, apply for a project that might be ideally performed live, but maybe because of the COVID restrictions might not be able to do so. And also if it's, for example, like um, Michelle's project, an album, will it be uh, expected to be performed um, live or is the album itself a project? So it's more about the format. Um, I have seen like three or four questions on that. So I would say, you know, like which, if all, all uh, like different formats are like possible in terms, for example, of, of music or performing arts, and also what to do with um, uh, applications that, um, you know, like are, if, if they have to consider COVID restrictions when applying at this moment, when we don't know what's gonna happen in the upcoming months. Okay, so if I understand correctly, to summarize, it's a question about um, best strategies for presenting work that may need to be online um, and how to contingency plan around COVID. Um, I actually would love to uh, send this question to Jenna, given it's um, specific to the Queen's Art Fund application this year. Sure, thanks, Kelly. I think. Um, I think this goes back to the evaluation criteria. Um, you know, for the Queen's Arts Fund, um, as was mentioned, feasibility is a big, um, a big question. Um, just to do a brief overview of the QAF evaluation criteria, it's artistic merit, quality and clarity of proposed project description, demonstration of community benefit, and clearly defined ability to successfully complete the project. So COVID kind of throws a wrench in everything and um, kind of creates an entirely new system. I think um, for panelists as well, while they're reviewing the applications this year, um, it's just going to be a new system for understanding um, how does someone demonstrate the ability to successfully complete a project this year. Um, but for the QAF application, um, a question has been added this year for the organizations and individual artists um, on a contingency plan. So in addition to um, the project narrative, there is an opportunity to kind of expand on your plan Bs, um, as well as um, we are accepting applications for online events. Um, so I think it's considering what works best for your project, um, how to demonstrate feasibility, um, even in a world where we just don't know what the next few months will hold. Um, but I hope that helps answer the question. Well said, thanks, Jenna. Daniel, any other questions that we can answer? Yeah, actually like, um... Midori Larson is wondering who is like an ideal reader for a proposal uh, before submitting it. Who do you recommend people, uh, you know, like uh, share their proposals with uh, before submitting it so they have a successful uh, application? Good question. I've heard, I have some colleagues in the field that talk about how it's helpful to have someone who is not in the arts read your application. I, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think that serves a purpose. Uh, panelists, what do you think? Um, I think sometimes even your colleagues or everybody else might be oversaturated in, in getting, um, you know, or understanding different ideas and projects that they're also applying for. So maybe it's a good thing to be, uh, to have a friend or a colleague or a professor, you know, a mentor, advisor, <laughs> who might not necessarily be connected to arts, but appreciates arts to um, briefly review it. But again, that could be just one of at least maybe two people that that should review it. So it, it would be it would give a good, good angle, give us a chance, us, 
non-artists. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, are, are there ever any grants for just fine artists? Is, is the community spin and the underrepresented people kind of the, the way it's more social, social um, arts than uh, fine arts, you know, like, you know, there's, I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful that you do this. I really do, but I'm, I'm basically a fine artist and I don't, I'm not really a, a incredibly, you know, community type person. So th this is probably would be definitely the wrong, um, you know, place for a fine artist to apply for, for a grant. That, I mean, it will say, save me a lot of time knowing this, but I mean, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about it. I think it's, I think what you do is wonderful. But uh, I beg to disagree, Jean. I'm a painter for the most part. I mean, I do a lot of other things too, but I'm a painter essentially. Mm -hmm. If you had a series, a body of work that you wanted to create that had a message that you felt was necessary to share with a community, you could propose to do a solo show in a, a traditional gallery space. Mm -hmm. So it's, it really is a matter of how, you know, I don't want to make it sound, uh, you know, trifling, but what's your spin? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a painter and you want to do a series of, of portraits of, you know, the people that you see on the street or something like that, you know, if you have a narrative around that body of work mm -hmm. and it's going to be new, there's no reason why you should exempt yourself from that because you're still presenting the work to an audience. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. I, I just, that, that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know what you, I know what you're saying though. There's a lot of social practice out there, but the, the new work is new work. And if the kind of work that you do is traditional, there's no reason why you cannot uh, propose that that traditional work be put out there for an audience in green. Oh, it's, it might not, my work's not traditional. <laughs> it's just not social. It's just, it's, it's very personal and internal kind of work. Um, it's not really, um, but that's, you know, <laughs> well, we'll see, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I see Jenna is nodding vigorously. We get this sort of community and social practice question a lot. And, and Margaret's right, there, there is um, a lot of foundations and grant making organizations are focused on this kind of work. But um, Jenna, what are, yeah, what are your thoughts when you hear um, an artist sort of hesitant to apply um, given the social practice, the myth that it has to be social practice oriented? Yeah, I just really love Margaret's response um, that you don't need to exclude yourself. Um, I think uh, with the evaluation criteria, there is that component um, of community engagement, but the, the work, um, but there's a way to show and demonstrate community engagement, even if the work you're creating itself isn't about community or that's not the um, the topics that you're most interested in, in working with. So um, yeah, just uh, really appreciated Margaret's response. Thank you. I think the latest question um, from Tim Erickson is related to this conversation about um, new work, sort of art, for, to, to oversimplify it, art for art's sake versus for the community benefit. Um, so he asks, is there an emphasis more on the audience service versus the creation of a new project. For example, a writing project of a novel that has a small reading of the novel in order to accomplish the audience asset. Um, yeah, I wanna ask, say Jen, do you have thoughts on this? I think this is a Queen's Art Fund sort of oriented question as well. Do we lose say Jen? Um, I think, well, this is, this is kind of hard for me to wrap my head around because, you know, I think, um, like when I was looking over, um, panelists, uh, applications, I think ultimately, as long as you had a vision that we could see, I think that was the most important part. I'm being really blunt here, but I mean, and also adding to what Margaret was saying, um, you can always propose new work, a body of new work that 
you see as aligned with the community. And I think no better place to do it than um, in Queens, because I mean, I, we're such a tight knit community anyways, just being in the city of New York, you know, there's people around everywhere. Um, I mean, I, I'm seeing this in COVID times, but even look at us now, we're literally a Brady bunch of people. Um, there's just so much potential for doing work with community members. Um, but again, I'm going to go back to what I said originally, I think as long as we can, uh, we understand what you're proposing. I think that's the biggest part. Thanks, Ajahn. Makes sense. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, if anybody wants to drop that into the chat, we would be happy to answer it. Someone was asking if it would hurt an application to have a collaborator, a collaborator who is not like Queens based. My understanding is no, not at all. Is that right, gentlemen? Yep. No, we typically have, um, you know, lots of artists uh, and creatives are involved in the making of any project typically. And as long as the lead art artist applicant is queen space, we're all good. Any other final questions? I actually recommend people to uh, download the chat because Jenna and I answer to some of the questions uh, by typing the answers. So feel free to do so. And maybe you can come back to other people's questions while you are preparing your application um, um, and, and answer some of uh, questions that you might have in the future. Absolutely. So on that note, um, we will follow up with everyone um, here, uh, as well as everyone who RSVP because may get to send a recorded, uh, a link of the recording of this, as well as uh, a transcript of the chat that you can revisit later. I'll also circulate um, the brief overview slide deck. Um, and just want to uh, also mention to everyone that if you're in this room, you have first dibs for our upcoming Ask a Gatekeeper series on January 21st, where I'll you'll have the opportunity to sit down with the panelists and talk through your application one-on-one. -on -one. So definitely encourage you to um, sort of apply anything that you hopefully learned um, or um, were inspired uh, by today and the session and work on your application. And we're, we would love to see your progress and spend some time with you one-on-one -on -one, um, January 21st before um, the deadline for QAF. And again, we'll be check your email, um, we'll be following up with an announcement and invitation for that. Um, I'll also be sending you all sort of a survey that asks for feedback um, in that this is a, a new professional development program structure for us that we're trying out. So we'd really value your feedback and thoughts on um, what works, uh, what you might suggest or what types of professional development you would like to see more of from us moving forward and we sincerely will read that and um, enable it to inform our programming moving forward. Um, and finally, just a huge thank you to our three amazing panelists who, um, yeah, really were so lovely and supportive and as always had really insightful um, thoughts and feedback regarding these applications and just really appreciate your time and everything you do for the Queens Arts community. Um, and also huge thanks to Jenna and to Daniel for helping keep this Queens Council in the Arts thing running. Um, thanks everyone for spending this evening with us. We really hope that it was helpful and um, you know, our respect that you took time out of your Tuesday evening to um, pursue your artistic practice and professional practice. That's something that's um, not easy to do and especially not easy to do uh, in 2020. So um, all the best you all stay safe and uh, we hope to hear from you all soon. Take care. Good Thank night, you, everyone. Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for a great presentation. Carl Bartlett. <laughs>